here we are again in Beijing on this uh, nice Sunday. As you can see, it's become very warm now. Uh, within just a week or two, having to wear my warm winter coat to now wearing just a t-shirt. That's how spring works in China. It's really just a week or two uh, as we move from winter to summer. Um, behind me is a shopping street, which I'm just gonna walk through uh, next. And as always, I want to talk a few words about my daily life in China before going to today's main topic, which is Taiwan. Why do I want to talk about Taiwan, though? Um, it's on the sidelines, well hidden by the Ukraine crisis. Um, there are some changes happening about Taiwan. And even if they weren't happening now, in the next three to five years, Taiwan's going to be a huge topic. So today I want to just start with the first kind of backgrounder, looking at what different countries really say about Taiwan or rather the Republic of China. Uh, is it a country? Is it not a country? Who has recognized it? In what form? What does the recognition mean? And was, what does Taiwan itself say? So you can see there's a Burger King. I don't know if you can see it. There's also McDonald's right next to it. Inside, there's also Starbucks and, and all these big brands, the Pizza Hut, etc. Um, whereas the Chinese restaurants, they're more like downstairs. So um, yeah, that red roof, that's the escalator that I'm going to take now and I'm going to go downstairs. And um, what I want to show here in this uh, shopping street, again, this is really outskirts of Beijing. It takes about half an hour to one hour. Uh, by highway to the city center. It's about 20, 25 kilometers away in the north of Beijing. Um, yet they keep improving or increasing the quality of life in these outskirts. Uh, flats aren't cheap either. Uh, it's not like you might imagine that the farther from the center you get, the more uh, low the cost of living. Um, it, it's more the quality of life is probably better because in, in the city center where you pay insane amount, insane prices for apartments, you only get really like old houses, small apartments, no green around the house. Whereas here for the same price, you get um, yeah, nice neighborhoods, a lot of parks. Uh, and now they build one on one these, these um, shopping experiences. Um, and so you've just seen all the American brands, I think it's their policy to be always located front and center so that the first thing you see is that American brand, uh, like McDonald's, like uh, Burger King, etc. But um, now I'm downstairs and here you get all these uh, local restaurants with Chinese food. Uh, this is a famous, this yellow writing is a famous uh, uh, shop for bouts about this, like stuffed buns. It's like a soft steamed bread with a, a stuffing inside. It's especially famous because in a PR stunt some years back, Chinese President Xi Jinping went to one of their outlets uh, to eat that traditional dish, claiming that he was just hungry and that he has to eat like everyone else and that he just felt like uh, getting food for himself. <laughs> Obviously, he never did it again afterwards. He was never seen in a public restaurant afterwards again. So, so much for, yeah, spur of the moment. But anyways, people loved it. Uh, uh, people went to the same restaurant standing in line for hours to eat what he had ordered um, the outlet made a special dish called I, I don't know what they called it they don't use Xi Jinping the name because that's always sensitive because then um, yeah the authorities get involved but something like a president's dish or something like that <laughs> um, here central of this shopping street They've put up uh, yeah, this kind of entertainment, kind of little, um, how do you call these? I mean, it's small, it's just like a small place for children to, to play all kind of things. Um, and this central square of the shopping street, they always change what they have. Right now there's a go-kart, little uh, horse. And um, yeah, this is gradually increasing the quality of life in the, in the outskirts of Beijing, thereby obviously reducing the pressure on the, on the city center, also on the roads that lead into the city center. Um, 
because people can just stay here with their children, take them here for fun. And um, there are tons of people doing just that. Uh, I think what I also want to illustrate with this these days, maybe uh, you hear the news about Shanghai still. Shanghai is now in a severe lockdown. Um, and it's quite serious. Like I hear from people that I know in Shanghai that you know, they tell me like, oh, we're fine, we still have food. <laughs> it's not a statement that you would have imagined just a few weeks back that somebody replies to how are you by saying we still have food. Um, but um, they complain, some of them, some of my friends complain that, yeah, they still have rice and staples left. They're not hungry, but uh, they don't have fresh vegetables. It doesn't get delivered. One reason being that truck drivers don't go into the city because they're afraid if they go to Shanghai they cannot get out or if they go out they have to quarantine for two weeks and nobody's gonna pay them for that time so it's a logistical nightmare uh, in parts it's being alleviated by the army so the Communist Party sends in soldiers to to help with uh, logistics and we all hope it's improving in a few days uh, I also saw pictures just these days about uh, Guangzhou shopping centers where vegetables are in short supply uh, because people are stocking up just to just in case um, near Guangzhou, Guangzhou to, to those who aren't familiar with China is in the far south, it's near Hong Kong and uh, some people, all, another city there, Shenzhen, has had a lot of cases recently and so people are stocking up their supplies in case their city gets locked down. Uh, I'm looking down here, no, um, yeah, I was looking for the cinema, there's a cinema somewhere here, um, there's tons of cinemas, but I'm not very familiar, and I'm just checking if it's open, I think it is open, uh, because I've read in some foreign media that they say like, oh, in China, uh, everything's going on lockdown, people are f afraid of going to the movies, and I was just like, well, yeah, China is big, uh, it's not the case in Beijing. As you can see in the background, tons of people outside. A lot of people do wear face masks again just because there have been some cases in Beijing. People get the news from Shanghai. People are worried, so they kind of wear more face masks again. But they don't isolate. They don't, uh, they're not afraid of going out. And there's tons of people uh, in these places. I said it's a Sunday today, so obviously people aren't in school. So children are in school, people aren't working. So yeah, this is how life goes on in Beijing. And obviously we all hope that it stays this way. Never know if Omicron also rips into Beijing, how they will try to stop it again. And regarding the methods, I hear some complaints in Shanghai. And some people complain about the zero COVID strategy, but I think they're still a minority in Shanghai and they're definitely a tiny minority in the whole of China. The overall sentiment is still this pride that China beats COVID and um, that the elderly have to be protected because they haven't died in China. A lot of uh, elderly have died in the West and um, you know that's something that the Chinese say we cannot let that happen in China. We want to protect everyone. And this talk about vaccines not working and whatnot. Uh, the thing is the vaccines were never intended to work against the spread of COVID. What they are intended is to prevent severe illnesses. And if we look at numbers from Shanghai, what I hear these days is like, they find they do not complete uh, testing of the whole population, 25 million in Shanghai. And they find like 20,000 new cases every day of which almost all are without any symptoms. So uh, the symptomatic cases are four or 500 per day and the 20,000 are asymptomatic. So Omicron also in China, it doesn't really hurt the people. Of course, for me as a Western, it begs the question if so many people have no symptoms, why still care about zero COVID? But again, I don't feel entitled to judge. It's the Chinese decision. And what I feel in the population, a vast majority is still very much in favor of how it's handled. So that's, to me, that's just how it is. And obviously I'm lucky not to be in Shanghai. So it's easy for me to say, again, I feel with all friends in Shanghai, 
with all the people I don't know in Shanghai and I hope the situation gets better soon. But now let's turn to the main topic, um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is the international status and uh, how it came to this status. I'm not going to go too much into the history because that's a huge topic in itself. And I think everybody watching this channel will know that historically uh, Taiwan was a part of the uh, Qing China. Uh, it was then part of the Republic of China. And um, at, at one point in the civil war between the Nationalist Party and the Communist Party of China, the Nationalist government, the Republic of China government, fled to Taiwan when the Communists took over Beijing. And then one by one countries around the world uh, switched their recognition from this Republic of China government to the Chinese government, to the People's Republic of China government, which is uh, today's, what we call China today, whereas what we call, or what some people call Taiwan, uh, is still controlled by a government that is called the Republic of China. And um, yeah, here's now these recent months and years, more and more the discussion uh, will, should Western countries recognize Taiwan as an independent country? And there's basically, I see two general views, very like broad stroke two views. One is the historic view, which says, well, Taiwan was part of China. There's no legal way of splitting parts of China away from China, according to the Chinese constitution, both the Republic and the People's Republic of China do not allow uh, parts of China to split away. Um, and the other view is a kind of populist democratic, I would call it, to just say, well, the people on the island of Taiwan, they want to be an independent country, so let them. Why don't we let them? And um, yeah, it's, it's hard to do a final conclusion um, if one doesn't have like a basis of values and if we don't agree on the basic value is history an important guidance to to how laws and, and nations are, are made up or should we only care about the present day the popular sentiment and of course <laughs> what I don't accept is double standard for example, to say, well, um, Catalonia is not allowed to have a referendum on independence because Spain doesn't allow that, but Taiwan should be allowed the same thing. So, so in my view, you have to go all in, either say whichever country, whichever part of a country wants to break away from any country, uh, we support that as long as the majority of the people want it, or to say, well, the there's laws, there's a constitution, and uh, one cannot break that just because a, a region, part of the population wants that. And obviously you can hear my personal stance tends more towards the, the constitutional approach. Also because I find it very difficult to say like, how large or small would a part of a country have to be to be able to break away and in the extreme case, obviously, you could just go and say, my own household, my family, we want to break away. We don't want to pay taxes anymore. We want to be an independent country. And um, we have a vote, me and my wife, we voted to be independent. So now we're not going to pay taxes anymore. Uh, we're not going to recognize the government anymore. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's an absurd example. But for me, the question would be, where do we draw the limit of when a country or when a group of people is large enough to, to have the right to become independent against a constitutional provision? So with that uh, part uh, introduction about the, system, the, the, the value system between constitutionalist and, and popular populist democratic, uh, let's let's uh, look at how some countries actually do recognize China and Taiwan. And I want to start with my own country, Switzerland. And I want to read that because I think the Swiss position is very interesting. 
as it's, uh, it's, it's very clear, very explicit and leaves absolutely no doubt of where Switzerland stands. And the position is uh, from the 1950s and it's still valid. It says, since Switzerland recognized the PRC on 17 January 1950, it has aligned itself with its One China principle and considers the Republic of China, the name adopted by the authorities of Taiwan Chinese Taipei, to be a non-independent territory which is part of China. At the bilateral and international level, Switzerland only maintains relations with the People's Republic of China with its seat of government in Beijing. So there's absolutely no doubt by the Swiss authorities as to what Taiwan is. It's a non-independent territory that belongs to China and is governed uh, by the government with its seat in Beijing, i.e. the People's Republic of China, the communist government. And Switzerland only maintains international bilateral relations with the People's Republic, not with any authorities on Taiwan, which, as the Swiss correctly point out, call themselves the Republic of China, which obviously is a historic remnant because uh, that used to be the government of the Republic of China that fled in the civil war and has since turned democratic. It wasn't democratic when it went to Taiwan, um, it has since turned democratic and uh, s several uh, various parties, uh, two parties mainly, have shared the power. The original Kuomintang, which was the party that led the civil war against the communists, and now the uh, Minjindang, what's it called? People Progressive Party, I think is the English name, um, which is currently in power. And they've always been more pro-independence, whereas the Kuomintang They've always stated that they consider themselves part of China, although the, the, they don't want to be subject to the communist government. And they would, they originally wanted to actually take back control of all of China, which now obviously nobody believes anymore that that might happen. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, Switzerland is, is very, very clear. Another one that I've looked at is France and I found it a bit difficult because I didn't find a, 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 like the foreign ministry didn't, doesn't have or I didn't find a, a clear statement as to what France says about Taiwan and their relationship to the Republic of China versus the People's Republic. Um, I, I, I did some searching online. I speak some French. I can read it, but uh, I might not have... Uh, found if they have an official statement but what i have found is by the foreign ministry like a fact sheet and that does look a lot like calling taiwan a country which is uh, in violation of the one china principle the one china principle saying that there's only one china um, and taiwan is part of china so the french they don't have direct relations they don't have an embassy in in taiwan but they have at least on their internet a fact sheet that looks like taiwan being a, a, a country although maybe not an independent one maybe not a recognized one but it's it's kind of like a country and um, then i've looked like how did they switch their relationship from recognizing the republic of china to the people's republic of china which happened in uh, 1960s by the French general Charles de Gaulle, who was then French president. And Charles de Gaulle, he first pays homage to the uh, anti-communist leader Chiang Kai-shek for, for fighting alongside with the Allied forces against the fascist Japan. And in his statement, he says, um, great respect for his bravery and patriotism and um, he's convinced that with time and history and the Chinese people sorry with time history and the Chinese people will also pay such respect to Chiang Kai-shek for fighting the Japanese and indeed to, to a large extent this has happened at least with the uh, with the people progressive party now democratic progressive party I think it's called in English in, in Taiwan, 
nowadays most mainland Chinese prefer the the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, uh, that Chiang Kai-shek was a leader. And you can find some uh, like statues and, and, and images and and like villa where Chiang Kai-shek has lived. So he's not like a deleted person. He's not considered an evil person per se. I mean, he was defeated by Mao Zedong and, and clearly his government is considered not legitimate. But it, it's also recognized that he did a lot to fight the Japanese. Uh, last year, two years ago, there, there was this uh, movie that came in Chinese cinemas called 800. It's uh, based on a true story of like a small group of people, even less than 800. They pretend to still have 800 people, but there were even less defending a warehouse in, in, in Shanghai against the invading Japanese and wave after wave of attackers uh, run up against them and they defeat one wave after another before ultimately evacuating to the international zone of Shanghai where uh, the Japanese uh, have agreed not to attack and they suffer heavy losses but they keep the defense of Shanghai alive until uh, reinforcements arrive and like the crucial scene what I found very fascinating that crucial scene of that movie 800 is when after waves of attacks uh, and also like air uh, attacks, air raids with fighter planes uh, attacking the rooftop of the warehouse and they keep raising the flag of China again and again and you know the dramatic patriotic music, the almost uh, the injured almost dying soldier putting the flag up again and it's the flag of Taiwan today or the flag of the Republic of China and that was shown all over China. It was a huge blockbuster too. It was a very successful movie, which, which just shows, I mean, the people aren't ignorant. They know that during the war against Japan, China was still officially ruled by the uh, Republic of China and that Republic of China flag, although now it's obviously not allowed to, to, to hoist that flag and, and, you know, kind of show, show allegiance to the Republic of China but historically it's well known that it's, uh, it, it, it uh, used to be the Republic of China leading the fight against Japan. So yeah, um, so Charles de Gaulle was right over time uh, that tension, that internal conflict has changed in quality. So historically Chiang Kai-shek is recognized as having done good as well as bad. Uh, next country I've looked at is Germany and Germany I find quite worrying uh, since the change of government just recently, I think a week or two ago, apparently the Germans have changed the way they describe their relationship to Taiwan. And um, what they now have on their website is a very, very short statement. Let me make sure that I don't say it wrong. Uh, yeah, the German government says we do not maintain relations with Taiwan. And if you like, remember what I just introduced about the Swiss position that says Taiwan is governed by Beijing and we do maintain relations with the government in Beijing. Well, obviously Switzerland does have uh, relations with Taiwan, but through the government in Beijing. Now, uh, the Germans basically are saying Taiwan is a country with which we do not have a relationship. Which is of course a first step away from the position of we recognize one China which includes the island of Taiwan. So as this has just recently happened in the new post Merkel government, I am afraid that this means a change of stance and that this is actually intended to mean what it looks like it means. It's paving the way to recognizing Taiwan. And um, this is also confirmed by, uh, for example, what I found is, is an interview with a, a lady called Janka Ertel from the EU Council of Foreign Relations, who speaks of new realities, which begs the question, what about the realities is new? <laughs> I mean, the island of Taiwan has been controlled by the Republic of China for the last, what, 50, 70 years almost, 70 years. 
and um, nothing has changed. So what is new about the realities? The only thing I can see is that Trump obviously said he contemplates recognizing Taiwan as an independent country. And now with the change in German government, there's a new reality in that uh, it's not Merkel anymore, uh, who was internationally a very careful politician, uh, a very real politic politician who looked out for uh, the, the German interests, which obviously economically, Germany has huge interests in mainland China, in the People's Republic of China. Uh, you see in my background, by the way, this is a VW car, German car. More than half of the profits of VW come from the People's Republic of China. Losing that market would be devastating to not just VW, but to like all major industrial companies in Germany, Siemens, BMW, Mercedes, they all have huge stakes in, Beijing, in China. So losing that market would be devastating for, for Germany, especially now as Germany is shooting its own foot with sanctions against Russia, which uh, seem to be driving up energy prices, which again is very destructive for the German industry. And luckily, I'd say Germany is still a country that's main wealth comes from its industrial base. It doesn't solely rely on, on financial institutions. Uh, it, it creates real products with real value. And now <laughs> that's threatened by increasing oil and gas prices. To open a second front, really just now, by taking steps towards uh, saying Taiwan is a country, although we don't recognize it, thereby saying we don't recognize the one China principle anymore because there are new realities. I personally find it very dangerous. I'm not a politician. I'm not holding any elected office. I'm not German either. I'm Swiss. So it's not up for me to judge. But I don't know if Germans are aware that this is happening and if they were aware whether they would really approve of it. Uh, and with that, let me go to the next country, actually the UK and the US. Uh, I, I want to take to some extent together because they use the almost same wording, the, the wording how they recognize the One China principle is they acknowledge the position of the People's Republic of China, that there's only one China, which includes Taiwan. And that's, of course, a deliberately ambiguous uh, statement which you can read as we we recognize and and agree with the people's republic of china position after all we have diplomatic diplomatic relations with them even though or with the fact that we know that they consider taiwan as part of their territory and because we want to have the relations with the people's republic of china we have stopped our formal and official relations with the Republic of China, with the authorities on Taiwan. That's one way to read it. Recently, especially from the US, I hear another way of reading it, which is, well, we only said we acknowledge that the Chinese think that, but we don't agree with it. Uh, I find that... Uh, I find it very dishonest, because obviously it's not violating the wording which was ambiguous but it's violating the spirit and why do i say this uh this, so there's the the english statement goes on by saying this remains the basis of our relations with taiwan so meaning we stopped our relations with the authorities on taiwan because we acknowledge that our recognized people's republic of china considers taiwan as part of their territory and the second statement, we avoid any act which could imply recognition of Taiwan as an independent country. So they are really saying we do not take steps that help Taiwan to split away from China. And if you say that, but then claim, well, we never said we actually agree with it, it kind of feels like violating the spirit. And I use that word because that was the argument for the US to leave the JPCOA, the, the so-called Iran deal, 
the US acknowledged that Iran did not break any provision in that deal, but they had uh, they, they felt that Iran is breaking the spirit of that deal. And um, so that's why they, they broke the, the contract. Uh, and in this case, I'm quite convinced that what the, in, what the US is doing is breaking the spirit by saying we acknowledge that the Chinese think Taiwan is part of the territory, but we don't agree with it. And there's also a study that I don't know how authoritative it is, but it, it sounds very convincing to me uh, when it claims that the US, when it recognized the PRC, it said uh, it recognizes the People's Republic of China as the government of China. It never said that it kind of recognizes a new country, PRC, which is besides the existing country, Republic of China. So it, it, it didn't say we now recognize another country. It says for the same country, which is China, we recognize a new government now. Um, and even more clear was a court decision in the US where um, the US courts say, see China as part of the Warsaw Convention, even though it was the Republic of China government that signed China's participation in the Warsaw Convention. Uh, same for another for, for a number of other conventions, by the way, the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the participation in the United Nations, these were steps taken by the uh, Republic of China government. And when the People's Republic took over the country of China, it kept these commitments in place. Now one can argue like how, how much the Human Rights Convention is kept by China, but it's recognized at least by China officially. China adheres to it and, and, and respects it. Uh, I don't want to go into the discussion of human rights in China in this video, but I, what I want to make clear is that commitments made by the Republic of China are still kept by the communist government because it's uh, seeing itself and it's seen by US courts as well as the successor of the government of the Republic of China. And the same is uh, true for the United Nations. Uh, and in, in my view, the United Nations is the most authoritative, the ultimate body that recognizes countries as independent or not, because the United Nations consists of virtually all countries in the world. The United Nations, they recognized the People's Republic of China only in the 1960s. Uh, it's called the Resolution 2758. And it's very short. It, I was surprised how short it is because I've never looked it up before. But for this video, I just wanted to see what does it actually say in the original. And, and what's very important there is the sentence, the representatives of the People's Republic of China are the only rep legal representatives of China. So again, uh, the United Nations didn't recognize a new country or a different country than what was in the United Nations before. They recognized a new representative for the existing country, China, which included Taiwan up to that point and still in uh, includes Taiwan at this point now. And they expelled the Republic of China government and didn't recognize a new country. And in United Nations documents, China is uh, always uh, mentioned as a member since 1945, which is a time in which the People's Republic of China wasn't even established. So the PRC didn't even exist when China joined the United Nations. Nonetheless, the now PRC represented country in the United Nations is called China. It's not called the People's Republic of China. So according to the United Nations, the PRC clearly represents all of China. And now maybe most important, let's have a look at what Taiwan says itself. And now, obviously, there are many voices in Taiwan. There's uh, many surveys regarding the feelings of the majority of the people in Taiwan. And that will be a different video where I go in, in depth about maybe popular sentiment on China mainland as well as on Taiwan. 
Today I want to talk more about the legal positions as for the other countries. I've also spoken about the legal positions. I forgot to mention one thing that I find very annoying, very shocking almost, is that the Swiss public media, even the ones that are financed directly by the Swiss government, they go so drastically against the official government's position. As I said, the Swiss government's position is very clear. We do only recognize the People's Republic, and that includes the territory of Taiwan, which we don't consider an independent country, yet the Swiss media always mention Taiwan as a country and say it's a disputed and the status is, is unclear, etc. Well, it may be unclear for some people, but not for the Swiss government. And if you're in Swiss media, I would hope that you respect the Swiss government's position or at least mention it sometimes. And I never see it mentioned. Uh, all right, but now let's look inside of ta Taiwan. Legally speaking, there's no government of Taiwan. So the constitution in Taiwan is the constitution of the Republic of China. And um, you may have heard that in many channels, but what I want to add now is to look at some positions that are mentioned inside this constitution. So the constitution of the Republic of China, the Article 4 is about the territory which may not be altered. So again, the territory as it historically exists includes obviously the whole of China mainland and Taiwan. Uh, in fact, the Republic of China also lays claim onto uh, Mongolia, which is now an independent country. Um, even though, yeah, I, I, I always read that the, 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 the government, the de facto government on Taiwan is not uh, laying claim on China mainland anymore, but I don't read that in the constitution where it just says the territory may not be altered. And that was actually confirmed throughout uh, several revisions of the constitution. There's even the article 26 of the, and again, this is the current constitution that is used on Taiwan. There's the article 26, which talks about Tibet, Mongolia, and the border regions. So Tibet, Mongolia, and border regions obviously are all on the China mainland. None of them are on the island of Taiwan. So again, this is very clear, this constitution that is used in Taiwan is about all of China. And the border regions, I guess, that refers to Xinjiang. Um, it may also be parts of Yunnan, which obviously also have important land borders. Um, but yeah, that's not part of this video. Uh, and also section on, on provinces, again, uh, mentioned specifically, for example, the voting rights in Mongolia and in Tibet. And then there have been several, several revisions, actually seven re re revisions, since the, like the martial law was, was cancelled. That was cancelled very late, by the way. The martial law was introduced to fight the civil war. Uh, despite the martial law, the Republic of China lost that civil war. And they remained in place until like the late 1980s and some of these revisions in 1991 there was the first revision which in which there's this line that says to meet current demands of the first uh, uh, to meet current demands of constitutional rule before national unification so again 1991 very clearly the taiwanese government talks about national unification which they want to achieve one day which is the Chinese nation that unifies Taiwan and the mainland. The second, uh, no, let me jump to the fourth one, I just picked some uh, lines that I find very relevant. In the fourth revision in 1997 uh, there's mention of the Taiwan province. Uh, what is Taiwan a province of? Again obviously a province of the Republic of China. It's the largest province, uh, but Taiwan or the Republic of China, the authorities on Taiwan, uh, call it how you will, the Tsai Ing-wen government, they, lay, they do de facto control part of the Fujian province. Two, three tiny islands very close to the mainland of China are still de facto controlled from Taiwan, from the government in Taipei. 
And I'm not sure if the, the People's Republic government maybe kind of felt like it's good to leave that status quo because it makes it even more clear that this government in Taipei is not the country of Taiwan because if that was the country of Taiwan, how can it have parts of the province of Fujian in it? So in 97, Taiwan, of province, uh, Ta Taiwan is mentioned as a province. Then in 99, the fifth uh, revision mentions again very clearly these islands that I've just mentioned, Kinmen and um, what's it called, Matsu. Matsu, uh, Jinmen, uh, Kinmen in, in Mandarin, modern Mandarin, it's called Jinmen, the Golden Gate, uh, as part of the province of Fujian. Then in the sixth revision in the year 2000, again, it's repeated that the territory shall not be altered. And uh, very important in uh, 2005, the seventh revision uh, speaks of, it's not a new mention, but it's uh, again, 05 in the last revision explicitly mentions again, the free parts of the Republic of China, by which they mean Taiwan and these islands of the Fujian province as opposed to the unfree part of the Republic of China, which obviously means the mainland. So in the constitution that's currently used on Taiwan, including all the revisions, it's very clear that this government claims to represent the Republic of China and not some independent island nation. This is very important to keep in mind when talking about popular sentiment, when talking about international recognition. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a question under which circumstances could such a constitution be altered, under which circumstances a part of a country can break away against the constitution of the national government. Uh, so, so this can be discussed, but at the moment it's very clear that Taiwan is part of China according to Taiwanese constitutional statements. And before I end this video, I'm getting longer and longer, uh, just two words about the situation in mainland China. Mainland China obviously puts huge pressure on countries that want to violate this one China principle that consider uh, recognizing an independent country of Taiwan. It's an absolute red line for the uh, communist government in, in Beijing. And it's a red line for many reasons. One is the strategic military consideration of being encircled by hostile governments. Uh, obviously, as soon as Taiwan would become independent, it's very likely to, uh, to host US military bases, which together with Japan and, and, and some other bases to the south would almost encircle uh, China and could, in case of bigger tensions, uh, almost uh, block shipping routes out of China to the rest of the world. So there's a strategic consideration, but there's also the popular sentiment consideration. The population, the common people in China, they are very, very staunchly behind this one China principle. And any government that would give up such a large territory like Taiwan would face huge backlash in, in the Chinese mainland. So anyone who, who claims to stand with the Chinese people against the Communist Party, against the oppression and wants democracy in China, that people should be aware if there was public elections of the national government of China very soon. A populist would realize that by promising to unite the mainland and Taiwan could win elections. Like a, a, a government that would say, we stop playing around, we stop with all the fuss, we just use our super strong, powerful military to conquer Taiwan, they could easily win an election. And I don't think they would need to promise anything else. I think this is, would, would really rally a lot of the uh, Chinese people. I'm not saying that such military action would be very easy and very uh, surely successful. Um, what I'm saying is to promise such a military action would help uh, government to get elected. And 
so uh, yeah maybe we should be grateful to have the current system in the people's republic of china which ensures that wise and really forward-thinking long-term strategic thinking people lead the country as opposed to popular sentiment and kind of patriotic emotions because if uh, if there was uh, popular elections with the need for for these kind of emotional arousing popular spirits to get elected the taiwan card would surely be played very quickly by people who, who, who see its potential. So, yeah, this is what I've wanted to talk about today. So kind of the legal situation of Taiwan seen from various angles. And um, I'm definitely going to do another program about Taiwan, talking more about survey data, about popular sentiment in the mainland and on Taiwan. Um, but again, the one thing that worries me is China with its new very, very pro-US, pro-Atlanticist government changing the German stance. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find what the wording was of Germany before that, but the current wording really reads like a preparation to say Taiwan is a country and then asking rhetorically, why don't we recognize it? That's kind of wrong. We should actually recognize it. Uh, so, so that worries me and I, I, I wanted to make this video now because I think nobody noticed this new statement. It wasn't in the media, not even in the German ones. I didn't find much about it. Um, and it's these things, it's these tiny steps. Scott Ritter uses the great expression of shaping the battlefield. Here still in a not war uh, or pre-war if uh, worst case. Um, but in a diplomatic kind of form as well to in tiny steps change the wording to prepare for bigger changes uh, and then pretend like hey we, wait that was always the case why is China now angry uh, China is the aggressor uh, while pretending we didn't do anything while in fact they are now very quietly using a big crisis in Ukraine to, to change the wording, to change diplomatic stance, to change the facts uh, of the legal basis, and then later on come out and say, hey, um, yeah, this has always been our stance. Why is China so aggressive now? And China isn't dumb. <laughs> I mean, they see these things. They uh, note that the West is step by step eroding the one China principle making it hollow. Uh, Biden, in every call with Xi Jinping, says, yeah, I adhere to the one China principle. And the next day, uh, his politicians, his cabinet, uh, take another step in, in supporting a pro-independence movement on Taiwan. Now Nancy Pelosi is going to visit the, the, the U.S. Congress speaker, what is the title, Speaker of the House in the U.S. of the Democratic Party which is obviously a very high ranking political official. She's the third, uh, third highest politician after the president and vice president in the US. The US said they won't have uh, high level diplomatic exchanges with Taiwan. How is that not a break of, of promise? Yet they kind of make it sound like, well, you know, it's just an informal visit. Why could she not visit there? Uh, what's the problem? We're just talking. Um, it's this step-by-step step changing the facts on the ground and whenever China calls foul they point the finger and say China's the aggressor China's trying, trying to change the status quo because the changes that the West is doing are done in such incremental steps and kind of played down by the media that a lot of people in the West aren't aware that anything's happening they feel like nothing's happened why is China angry all of a sudden so yeah, that was part of the reason for me to do this video. Another reason is because I'm worried within the next three to five years, this whole Taiwan question may escalate. And again, as I think I've made clear, I don't think it's China that takes the first step uh, towards this escalation. I see that there are parts of Western society, of Western political establishment, I have to say, it's not the common people in the West who are pushing the Taiwanese political establishment towards uh, independence. 
uh, knowing, fully knowing that this is an absolute red line to the Chinese, uh, to the mainland China government. Uh, Taiwan declaring independence would be a reason for war. This has been declared for decades. And the fact that Taiwan still has a de facto government other than the PRC has a lot to do with US involvement. So that will be part of the next program looking at the history, looking at the civil war of China, how that played out, why did the communists win even though the Americans uh, supported the other sides, they supported Chiang Kai-shek. While the Soviet Union, they did support the communists, but at that time, coming out of the Second World War, the Soviet Union's support during the Civil War was not the decisive factor. So these are things that I'm going to talk about in the next video. For today, I want to end it here. I've actually passed 50 minutes. I'm going to try to be shorter again next time. Thanks for watching. Please like and forward and share helps the channel grow and it's free. Thank you so much.